Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is the Executive Vice President for Public Affairs at Third Way, Matt Bennett. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Last night was Super Tuesday, and as we sit here the day after, we have two presumptive nominees in former President Don Donald Trump and current President Joe Biden. To start off the conversation, I'm very curious, what are your takeaways from last night? Well, it was the most boring Super Tuesday we've had in a long time. Everything we thought would happen happened. And we ended up, as you say, with two nominees that everyone knew we would end up with. So uh, Nikki Haley has dropped out of the race now. Dean Phillips has suspended his campaign. No one's left other than uh, pure gadfly candidates. And both Trump and Biden are going to be nominated by their parties and they're going to be the nominee. Uh, there was a little bit more interesting stuff happening in other races down ballot, but um, everything shook out exactly as we thought it would. Let's talk about those interesting races before we get into the presidential race, obviously. I want to turn our sights to California. Adam Schiff and Steve Garvey won the most votes in California's primary, and they will be facing off in the general election in November. He's faced criticism for pouring millions of dollars in attack ads against Steve Garvey. Some have criticized him, saying that elevated a Republican instead of a Democrat. What do you make of that? Uh, that's how politics works. Um, what shift did, because in California, the top two finishers, regardless of party, move on to the November election, he wanted to face a Republican because in California, there is absolutely zero chance that a Republican is going to win a Senate race, particularly in a year when the presidential ticket is on the ballot. So he wanted a Republican in November. He did not want to run against Katie Porter, who is a very uh, you know, capable member of the House, uh, or Barbara Lee, an, another House member. And so what he did is he ran ads that said that Steve Garvey is a MAGA Republican, and that's bad. And look, that is a perfectly legitimate thing for Adam Schiff to be advertising about. It happens to be true. It is going to be the central charge that he brings against uh, Garvey in the fall. And the fact that it reminded Republican voters that they like Garvey and enough of them turned out to make him the number two, uh, that's just how politics works. If Democrats really believe that some Republicans, though, are a threat to democracy, why elevate them? Do you think that diminishes that argument at all? No, because he wasn't saying that Garvey's a great guy. He was saying that Garvey's terrible. <laughs> and so the fact that he was running negative ads against Garvey, I think, is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Had he been doing something else, which is to say, oh, you know, Steve Garvey is really a moderate and don't worry about him and he can be trusted, that would be pretty bad. But he didn't do that. He told what I believe to be the truth about Garvey. And he ran ads that he could be running tomorrow and the next day and all through November about how Garvey is a threat. So I really think it was legitimate. And the other thing I want to point out is that had Katie Porter, who uh, ran third in this race, had she won a slot in November, uh, had she come in second to Schiff and it was Schiff against Porter, a Democrat on Democrat race, it would have ended up being ruinously expensive. And tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, because California is so big, would have been spent on a Senate race that Schiff is now going to win easily and those resources can go elsewhere. I do now want to talk about Democratic voters on Super Tuesday voting uncommitted. The New York Times reported 19 percent of the votes in the Minnesota Democratic primary were for uncommitted. And this came after 100,000 people in Michigan voted uncommitted in that primary. Do you think this is a warning signal for President Biden? I do. I think it is a warning signal, and I hope that's all that it is. I hope, uh, you know, like most warning signals, it can be heated and the problem can be solved before it causes a real problem. What I think is vital for those voters who voted uncommitted to recognize is that it is perfectly legitimate for them to be angry at President Biden over a policy difference that's very real certainly understand how angry they are about the Gaza war. But I think they also have to reckon with the fact that in November, they will not be just registering a protest if they fail to vote for Biden. They will be making a choice. And that choice will be to help Donald Trump become president. Everything that those people care about, everything will be in jeopardy if Donald Trump becomes president. I mean, he has talked about a Muslim ban. He has talked about 
you know, helping Israel basically destroy the Palestinians. So on everything they care about, Joe Biden is a much better choice. And I think they know that in their hearts. And I think if they can um, find a way to support the president, they will be preserving their the things they care about uh, in a very fundamental way when they vote in November. How do Democrats, the Biden campaign specifically, heed this warning? What do you think that they need to do to change course within the eight months we have between now and November? Well, when you're president and running for re-election, you wear two very different hats. There's the Biden campaign and there's the Biden White House. The thing that these protesters, or these protest votes are being registered about is very much an official function of the president, which is how are we handling our relationship with Israel during the war in Gaza? So that has nothing to do with the Biden campaign. The campaign can't do anything about that. What President Biden does, I think, won't be driven by politics, but by principle. How does he believe he can most effectively both support our ally, who was viciously attacked by Hamas in October, but also provide relief to the millions of Palestinians who are suffering horribly under this incredibly uh, intense war that they're facing. So he's got to find a way to balance that. He's doing his best. I think when history looks back at this, they will say that he didn't have as much leverage as these folks think he might have. Netanyahu can conduct this war even without us. Um, and I'm hopeful that um, by applying the kind of pressure he's applying, we can get to a ceasefire pretty quickly. We're, it's Wednesday right now. A few hours ago, Nikki Haley dropped out of the race. And after that, President Biden released a statement. I want to read part of that statement. Quote, Donald Trump made it clear he doesn't want Nikki Haley supporters. I want to be clear. There is a place for them in my campaign. I know there is a lot we uh, won't agree on. But what are your thoughts here? Do you think that he could get Nikki Haley voters? How will Biden bring those over? Well, uh the other thing that, that you didn't read is the Trump response to Haley. And his response was, anybody that got anywhere close to Haley, we don't want you in our movement. So um, one is- Bi President, a Biden is that, um, President Biden essentially said that. He said that he made it clear that, Nikki Haley, that Trump doesn't want Nikki Haley's voters. So what it, should he do? How, how is he getting those? Oh, for sure. So I think what you're seeing is a fundamental difference between Trump and Biden. One of them believes in the politics of addition and the other in the politics of subtraction. Um, Trump believes that the purity of the MAGA base is the thing that he will that will carry him to the White House. And Biden believes that being the president for everyone, people who voted for him and people who didn't, red states and blue states, that will carry him back to the White House. We'll see which one is right. But in my experience, bigger coalitions are better than small ones in politics. So I think it's very smart for him to be reaching out to Haley's people. President Biden said he believes he is the strongest Democrat to beat Trump because he's the only one to do that. He said that in recent remarks to The New Yorker. Do you agree? Do you think he's the strongest Democrat now positioned to beat Donald Trump? I do for a variety of reasons. One is incumbent presidents, particularly incumbent presidents who have done a good job, tend to win. Now, I know that the president's approval ratings are low, and I know that people aren't feeling uh, all of the kind of benefits of the things that he's done in the last three years. I'm well aware of that. But I'm hopeful that that changes because all the economic indicators are pointing in the right direction. And uh, it is possible that over the course of the next few months, people will begin to really feel that in their lives. They probably won't feel the effects of the big pieces of legislation that he passed unless they live in places where, you know, the chips money or the infrastructure money or the IRA money is being spent. But he has eight months to make sure people understand what he's done and what his vision is for the future. So being in the incumbent president is really a huge advantage. Most of the time they win. And uh, I think that's true here too. And then the second thing I would point out is that unless you have run for president before, there is no way to know whether you, a successful governor or senator or elect, uh, any kind of elected official or, or other politician will be any good at running for president. I mean, we've seen people we thought would be good presidential candidates flame out horribly. I mean, Jeb Bush and, and um, and Ron DeSantis and a whole host of others 
who looked very strong going into the presidential race and then turned out not to be very good at it. So it's possible that the people that are always talked about on our bench will be great at running for president. I'm very hopeful that they will, but we don't know. Do you think then that Democrats have a messaging problem? Because according to a recent Harris X Forbes poll, more voters think that President Trump over President Biden would be better equipped at handling top issues such as immigration and the economy. So where do you think that disconnect is? Yes, I think we do have a messaging problem. And I think that there's a hangover effect from uh, from what Trump, you know, handed over to Biden, which was an economy in shambles in the middle of the pandemic uh, until now. So I, I think what people have failed to reckon with is how successfully the president guided us through the post uh, pandemic inflation, which was much worse in other developed countries, how successfully he has managed an incredibly narrow majority in Congress to produce incredible results. And, um, and the fact that we are facing a very strong economy with real tailwinds behind us. I mean, inflation is very low. Uh, unemployment is very low. The stock market is very high. I mean, your viewers know all of this, but I think most people don't. And I think we have eight months to make sure that that changes. All of those numbers suggest that, yes, the economy is doing better this year than it was at this time last year. But economic sentiment when it comes to voters is low. So how do Democrats change the messaging on this? Because any voter I talk to, they say, my wallet is hurting. It's tough to put food on the table. It's tougher than it was four years ago to put food on the table. So how do Democrats uh, fight this on the offensive rather than defensive? Well, I, I think we have to stipulate that the job is not done and that people are still hurting. But I do think we've got to make sure that people understand what has happened over the course of the last several years, where the United States has come out of the recession, out of the post pandemic, uh, you know, economic dislocation incredibly strong, where uh, the, the amount of investment in America under Biden is like 240 times higher than it was under Trump. All the things Trump brags about having done, Biden actually did and Trump did not. Trump did not get an infrastructure bill done. So our crumbling roads and bridges got no better under Trump. They're being repaired under President Biden. Trump did nothing to onshore critical things like um, silicon chips and other things that we are now building plants to build in the United States. Trump did nothing to uh, make sure that the United States is a clean energy leader. That's happening because of the IRA. We have got to make sure that people understand that's happened and that they understand that it's going to help them in their lives. I mean, I'm from Syracuse, New York. In my lifetime, I'm in my late 50s, there has never been a manufacturing increase in Syracuse, New York, until Joe Biden brought a gigantic chips plant to that city. And we got to make sure the people of Syracuse and the people of town, cities and towns like that all over the country understand that Biden did that. How do you get people to understand that messaging then? What do Democrats specifically need to do? Well, uh, you know, Biden in particular has the biggest of the bully pulpits. He has a big opportunity tomorrow night at the State of the Union address where he can talk through. Um, he can make sure that people understand several things. One is Joe Biden is very good at empathy, very good at making sure people understand that he knows what it's like to struggle. And the people that you talked about who are having trouble putting food on the table, he's been that. He, he lived that when he was a child. And he talked about that very successfully in 2020. I think he needs to do that again. And then he needs to walk people through what he has done over the course of the last three years and make clear that he's proud of those achievements, but that the job isn't done. And we're going to keep pressing to make sure that people can live a comfortable middle class life in America again. And with his policies, I think we're going to get there. Polls are close in head to head matchups versus Trump versus Biden. But a recent Harris X Forbes poll shows Trump beating Biden in a head to head matchup uh, by over or by four points. As someone who's worked on Democratic campaigns, does that scare you? Of course, um, it, you know, if you're not running scared in politics, you're losing. And so uh, I'm very scared by that. And I'm terrified by the prospect of Trump returning to power. It's a fundamentally 
a much more dangerous situation than we've ever faced in my entire experience in politics. So yes, I'm scared by that. However, I'm not panicked by it because we have eight months to change that. And remember, a four point gap is pretty small. It may be just outside the polls margin of error. Meanwhile, you know, polls have not been that precise in predicting the outcome of races lately. I, I very much remember being on a polling call at 6.30 p.m. on election day in 2016 and being told by Frank Luntz, a very famous pollster, Hillary's gonna win 330 electoral votes and easily win the election. That was with the polls having been open for eight hours. We are now eight months from election day. So I think you have to take all that with a grain of salt. Right now, we, it's shaping up to be a 2020 sequel. Like we said earlier, as of today, Trump and Biden are their party's presumptive nominees. What do you think then is the future of the Democratic Party? Because we saw this play out four years ago. It's a really important question and we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, Joe Biden is going, I think we can say this without, with confidence. He's the last of his generation to be a leader of the Democratic Party. There will be no others of, of his era. Um, and we're gonna see a new generation of leaders begin to emerge uh, after the election, whether Biden wins or loses. And we have, as I noted earlier, a number of very promising political leaders out there who could be could be very strong presidential candidates. We don't know if they will be, maybe, maybe not. But we've got, uh, you know, Governor Whitmer in Michigan. We've got Governor Shapiro in Pennsylvania. We've got Senator Warnock in Georgia, Governor Pritzker in Illinois, um, Governor Newsom in California. And of course, and I think most importantly, the vice president. So we've got a really deep bench. They will have to make their case to the people and, and um, struggle to be the leader of the of the Democratic Party in the future. But my hope and expectation is that Biden retains that title for at least another few years. As we sit here eight months out from Election Day, what is on your radar? The thing that I'm most worried about that we haven't yet discussed is the threat of third parties, because what, what we see in the data is that in a head to head matchup, as you noted, the race is pretty much tied. Maybe Trump is slightly ahead, but it's but it's basically tied. But when you add third party candidates like a potential candidate from no labels, uh, this purportedly centrist group uh, or uh, from RFK Jr. or more gadfly candidates like Cornell West and Jill Stein, it does help Trump quite a bit. And the reason for that's pretty simple. Trump has a fairly low ceiling. He, he will not exceed 50%. He will be below 50%. He may win anyway because of the Electoral College, but he can not get above 47, 48% of the vote. But his floor is pretty hard. If you're a Trump supporter, you're a Trump supporter. You don't leave him. Biden's ceiling is much higher. He can get above 50%. And we saw this in 2020, but his floor is soft. And there are people, not a lot, but enough maybe to be decisive in those swing states that might be attracted to a third party candidate if one are available. So we're really hoping in the end that there aren't major third party candidates because we think that would be uh, run an enormous risk of serving as a spoiler and helping Trump win. How do Democrats then secure those independent voters, people who might be potentially persuaded to vote third party? What should his messaging be other than, hey, I'm better than that guy and that guy meaning Donald Trump? Look, I think the bottom line is that's going to be most of the messaging. Um, we are run, we are in an era of what uh, the political scientists call negative partisanship, which means your vote is driven more by who you hate than who you like. And so I think it's going to be vital for the Biden team to make clear that if you fear a Trump presidency, as you should, uh, you need to vote for Joe Biden. If you vote for somebody else, you're throwing away your vote and you're helping Trump. A vote for Robert Kennedy is a vote for Trump. And that is gonna be a vital message. But of course, the president's gonna to have to make the affirmative case for him as well, for himself as well. That'll start with the State of the Union, and I think you'll see a lot more of that. And that's around issues like the economy, immigration, crime, uh, and foreign policy. Matt Bennett, thank you so much for your insight today. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you join me again soon. I'd love that, thanks.